Hello, players who refuse to buy a physical source book. And DMs who will literally write their own source book for every single campaign. Welcome back to Table Talk. Today's theme is all about D&D. What is it? That's Madison Conway and oh. I'm Robert Lopez. <laughs> And today we're talking about what is D and D with a little a little drop of tabletop RPGs in general. Uh, see, the podcast will mostly focus on D and D because it's what we have the most experience with. But there is kind of like this sub theme of tabletop RPGs as a whole because a lot of them are are similar in that you're at a table and you are role playing. That's what RPG means, role playing mm-hmm. game. So, so what is D and D? Uh, D&D, or Dungeons and Dragons, is a tabletop role-playing game by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, they're kind of like the biggest name in tabletop games. Oh um, yeah, 100%. I mean, they own more than just Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. That's just the, the biggest, one of the biggest TTRPGs out there and has been for quite a while. Um, fun fact, we are on 5e, so 5th edition, which means mm-hmm. there have been four previous editions to this. Um, and some people actually like to go back and run campaigns in old editions because the rules are different and the spell lists are a little different. Uh, like third edition is incredibly popular. Uh, like the races are different, backgrounds yeah. are different, stats are different. Like now it's like strength, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, yeah. dexterity, and constitution. And it used to be like, oh, there were some weird ones. I don't remember what they were exactly, and that's probably something I should have like looked up to have before this episode. Um, but th- stats were like completely different. So like everything changes a mm-hmm. little bit from edition to edition yeah and um, third edition was a lot less <laughs> third edition was a lot less balanced fifth edition characters yeah. at level 20 and in, cre- in like creatures at cr 30 so challenge challenge rating of 30 are a lot less broken than what they were in third edition because wizards hadn't quite put like the brakes on what you could do and so you just have these like insane stat rolls and abilities and just nutty stuff in third edition that they toned down significantly in fifth edition. Which um, you can still definitely break characters in five. Oh, a hundred percent. Min maxing is something that will never leave the hobby. Yeah. Um, so what is a tabletop role playing game? Uh, this is a little. It's hard to find like an actual definition on the internet that's yeah. not just like a bunch of jargon being thrown at and you. And they all do different things. Um, so our kind of definition for it is a tabletop role playing game in which uh, char- players create a character and take on that character, describe what they do, their actions, make choices for them, and it's traditionally run by a game master or GM of some kind who controls the game by describing the world, uh, creating the world, the situations, and the conflict that the character find themselves in yeah so some of them are very character creation heavy like dungeons and dragons kids on bikes uh but then others like alien which we attempted to play over the summer but did not have um like pre-constructed characters where you'll have a uh, a list of people or creatures or whoever you can pick from and then it'll give you like a, a a rundown list of what their abilities are what their personality is like what their role in the group is um, so some of them are a lot more accessible than D&D, uh, or even in Kids on Bikes, but at the same time, you can also buy what are called one-shots for those, where they literally mm-hmm. come pre-made. So it's still 5th edition systems, or still Kids on Bikes systems, but you already have a character to play. Yeah, There are just some that are a little more optimized for like sitting down for a couple of hours at a time, versus like playing something out for months, or a year, or two yeah. years say they really range in the time span that they can take up because there are some that are designed for like yeah you just sit down for an afternoon you play it with your friends and that's it Mm -hmm. and then you can also like i think dungeons dragons is especially suited for this like you can make something that lasts an afternoon or you can make something that lasts Mm -hmm. for like multiple years if you wanted to if you could manage the schedules Mm -hmm. which would be the most impressive part of that yeah and the two primary differences in I guess what people call them, you would have a campaign, which is anything, in my opinion, longer than like a month, and then a one-shot, which could be six to eight hours worth of playing. Sometimes you can chain one-shots. Other people will make campaigns off of one-shots. I've done the opposite. I've made one-shots off of campaigns. Uh, Yeah, shout-out to DMs. little tip from me. If you create all this content that nobody touches or finds or is interested in, and they still want to play a little bit more... Or even if you just want to pick a wholly new group of people, you still get to live out all of that hard work and content that you created in the form of a one-shot by just basically giving them a tiny little shitty hook in this little town that nobody explored with NPCs you wrote everything for that they just never touched in the main campaign. 
It's wonderful. It can also, if you wanted to, give you the opportunity to play characters that you've played in a campaign that you're like, okay, we've kind of exhausted this character and their mm. story here. Yep. Let's do a random one shot where it's like 20 years in the future and they're fully retired and they're like, oh, hey, mm -hmm. revisiting a plot hook. Yeah. One shots are fun for doing like level 20 characters or a very quick like level 20 campaign. Because I mean, once you hit level 20, which we'll talk about character creation more towards the end of the next episode, but once you hit level 20 as a player... It truly the amount of shit you have to manage it becomes insane. Um, it's one of the least optimized aspects of the game. But some other popular examples of TTRPGs to get back on track, you have like Vampire the Masquerade, mm -hmm. uh, Pathfinder, which is kind of like D&D &D adjacent, Kids on Bikes, Warhammer 40K, to an extent, it's more like, uh, it's not so much role-playing in that sense. I mean, I guess it is, because you like take the assumed role of like a commander, and you have your armies, and you build them, and... Sometimes, like, a Warhammer 40k battle can take hours, days, months, whatever, depending on the scale of it. But it's just kind of another example of not straight-up role-playing in the way that you even, like, embody a character that's more like taking the seat of a, of a commander and then, like, throwing these two fantasy armies at each other that you spent fucking, I don't know, 72 hours hand-painting just for you to be done in, like, an hour. Uh, a quick shout out to Kids on Bikes, their website, which is they're from Hunters Entertainment, um, who does some other games like um, I like Alice is Missing, which is also really good. They have a ton of free source free resources on their website, and they've got like basically free source books or like sample source books of the way to run their games, pre made characters, all that stuff. So I am always going to hype them up because um, they've got a bunch of free, super accessible stuff. The next kind of question that we wanted to hit was, how do you get into D&D? It feels like something that's like really intimidating because it's often a world full of people who have been in this world doing mm -hmm. this thing, been interested in this topic for years and years. Yeah, and there's always the backstory of like, I started playing in my grandmother's basement when I yeah. was but a wee boy and we played 72 campaigns and I never played a different character and I've never DM'd. Uh, it used to be very like... Y you could buy a source book or like I like neck beards. I'm, I'm a woman in the gaming space. So I am always going to kind of make that joke. Um, cause there's some crappy people out there sometimes, but yeah. Uh, in like talking about stranger things, D and D has mm -hmm. kind of been brought to the forefront in a lot of ways, not just yeah. because of stranger things, obviously. Um, but these are just, I, we compiled kind of like a list of, resources that you could like look to if you want to learn more about D&D &D, and then also um, how to get into D&D because &D, uh, there's a couple different ways to do that. Yeah so one of the easiest ways to like start um, <clears throat> one of the easiest ways to start like where you're from I guess is by going to like a local gaming store or a gaming cafe. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus sorry both of those are really good options. Holy fuck. Okay, you can take a drink. Yeah, I'm going to let you take okay, over while cool. I try and clear whatever um, the fuck is in my throat. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, check out your local game shops. Those are probably going to be your best resources. Most places are going to have an open night for, like, RPG games or TTRPG games, especially Dungeons & Dragons, where you can meet new people who want to play. Um, we've got a store in Evansville called The Gaming Guild. Uh, I know Wednesday nights they do an open RPG night. Uh, you can go. You can meet people. Um, if that seems intimidating to you, which that's A-OK. -okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're in school, check out, you know, the resources at school. There might be a club. I think there's a D&D &D club on our campus. Yep. I think there's a D&D &D club. There's also just like a uh, like a gamer society type deal where I think they do a couple of different TTRPGs here and there. But that's just kind of a mix of everything. Uh, also, shout out to uh, Book Broker here in Evansville. It's a store that's been around for a very long time. I don't necessarily think that they host any like open nights like Gaming Guild might. But they have uh, a lot of D&D source books. And what I will say is that while uh, some, some places, like maybe Barnes & Nobles or something like that, will like discourage, you know, cracking open a book, taking notes, and then putting it back on the shelf, like a book broker or a gaming guild, usually your local game stores are cool if you just take a book and sit down with it and put it back because they're expensive, especially ones that come from Wizards of the Coast, nothing mm -hmm. against it. I mean, the amount of content they put in those books is insane, but yeah. $50 is not the most accessible way to get into a hobby for the first time yeah so like yeah it might feel a little awkward to like pull up to a gaming store or a barnes and nobles or wherever and then take a source book down to one of their tables and sit down and take some notes but no one's going to tell you no and there should be no shame when you live in a capitalist capitalistic society there should be no <laughs> shame in not shelling out 50 dollars. when you live in a capitalist society like it's don't like, be afraid to steal 
Well, I don't know. If we're, well, I, hmm. I don't know if we're allowed to say that, but. I mean, don't be afraid to steal on a cap. Was I, I I, yeah, no, that. fair don't enough. Don't steal from Wizards of the Coast or the people that write the source books. Yes. Let's say that. We'll say and that. Don't be afraid to steal other non-related brand things. And, you know, if you go on the internet and you look up PDFs of things, mm-hmm. you know, maybe they exist, maybe they don't. I can't say that they do. Oh, yeah. I've never used a PDF uh, that was an exact rip of a $50 source book for a campaign I did like a semester ago. Uh, I've never done that. Why would I do that? Yeah, why would I would ever. stealing and we would never do that. Why would I ever type in the name of a source book verbatim and then just put free PDF at the end of it? That sounds yeah. like an insane thing to do. Yeah. So, like, totally don't do what you do with your college textbooks and just search yeah. everywhere to see if you can find Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, shout out to somebody in my, <laughs> my social problems class this semester. I'm not going to name that person, but they straight up dropped the PDF for the whole class in a oh, group email. Nice. $120 for the textbook. Ooh. Uh, 50 if you wanted to rent it online. Renting online for that much money <laughs> is such bullshit. Like, That's what? so funny. What? Like, why do you have to... I think that shit cracks me up that there's such uh. thing as renting online. Like, Amazon lets you rent movies for, like, $5 or buy it for 15 And I'm like, are you, what? It's like, first, I like, already it's pay not you for stopping me from, like, screen grabbing the entire film. Literally. Nothing. Nothing is stopping you. That's that's the answer. Another way you can get into tabletop RPGs, specifically D&D, is through watching things. Yes. Um, Legend of the Vox Machina on Amazon Prime is, like, an animated... Uh, campaign uh, mm-hmm. of something that Critical Role did. It was one of their first campaigns that they ever did. And it got its full, like, own animated show voiced by all the original cast members because a lot of them are voice actors in their spare time. Yes. In their it spare is... time. They're voice actors who play D&D in their spare time. Yeah, no, that's fair. Us, uh, like so like Alex Mercer fair. has been in everything. If anybody plays any video games or watches, like, any TV shows, you would recognize his voice very quickly. Yeah. He's McCree in um, Overwatch. Mm. He's, uh, God, he's been in a lot of different things that I play, but... Uh, Legend of the Vox Machina is probably one of the easiest and most accessible, like, traditional straight-up D&D campaigns. Yeah. It revolves around dragons. Not a huge spoiler. You kind of find out at the end. There's yeah. also, like, a sub-theme of dragons. But, like, you have your rogue and your archer and your, mm-hmm. it's and your paladin very, and your barbarian. It is very classic D&D, but it also feels... It, so it's that, like, high fantasy setting, but it doesn't feel stifling or, like discouraging in a way that a lot of for me like and i know it sounds stupid to say is someone who's like really into D and mm. these kinds of things i'm not the biggest fan of high fantasy yeah which... i have <laughs> i have some people <laughs> we play with that are like when are we gonna go back to a high fantasy setting i'm like listen it's been the horse beaten there's zero meat left on this dead horse yeah the horse is is like ashes like the bones have been destroyed i yeah. high fantasy is cool it's a grave at this point but like at a certain point you gotta look to more avenues than like an elf with yeah. a bow who calls himself legolas after a popular character in lord of the rings yeah like you know just but i will say something things. critical role does very well and in, in this show specifically is it makes that high fantasy setting feel more modern and less yeah. stifling so yeah, it's yeah, fun yeah. there's comedy in it mm. there's equal rights in it which is one there's of the things that i also kind quite of a bit fear of away from with high fantasy is there's always like this weird like we're gonna add fantasy racism in or mm-hmm. we're gonna have like three women in it and yeah. they never speak to each other shout out lord of the rings um oh my god what is it the the bethel test or the bechdel Bechdel yeah the bechdel test which it somehow passes oh because there's like one there's oh my god there's several compilations on tiktok i literally saw one again last night and it was like lord of the rings but every time two women interact on screen and there's exactly one one interaction at the very beginning and then roll credits yeah it's don't be that person yeah not to shit on the lord of the rings trilogy it's great it did a lot for what it was um several well one of my roommates one of my old roommates i guess they're both obsessed oh one of my best friends obsessed not with the the trilogy itself but with the books as well uh but they did a lot for like portraying that that high fantasy mm-hmm. um although his his version of it is very different than a tra- just straight up traditional high fantasy but it could be a cool starting point if you're just looking to see what that could be um and then another thing to watch, also on Amazon Prime, I don't know if we mentioned that for Legend of Vox Machina, is Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Um, my whole house went and watched that in theaters along with the other people that we play with. I, this is a quick 
quick sidebar. My favorite interaction from that night was it, it was like a whole big group of us that went. There were like eight yeah. or nine of us. And there weren't very and many people in the theater. No, it us. was a very, very late showing. And the movie like started late because it was like broken. Oh so my we God, finished yeah, the, the movie. We go outside and we're like, oh, let's try and get like a group picture in front of the sign. It'll mm-hmm. be cute. I'm like propping up my like phone to like try and take a video or a picture. Or I was taking a video and then we were going to take pictures from it. And then a group um, was walking by and they said, oh, we can take your picture. And we were like, oh, great. Thank you so much. And they said, oh, it's so exciting to see nerds out together in public. And I just, that was a wild sentence to say to a group of I people. And don't I don't remember about, being hate crime like that. that. <laughs> no, I don't remember I that at all. I think about it like every day. What the f- I mean, I feel like they had to have been nerds too, right? I, I'm confident that I hope they were. Otherwise, yeah. that's just a crazy thing to say to someone. But I think about that interaction a lot. So that's, anyway, D&D movie was great. There are too many ways I would love to spin that and flip it back. But all of them would be offensive to at least one group of listeners. So I'm not going to do that. That would be wise. But don't Don't say that shit. Don't yeah. say that shit in public. <laughs> Don't say that shit in public unless you want someone to throw it back. I'm not afraid to throw it back. Generally, I don't until the people walk away. But I will. And yeah, I, I will do it behind your back and you will feel bad. Yeah, it's it's rough. Anyways, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, Honor Among great Thieves. movie. Better than um, we thought it was going to be. Way better than we thought it was going to be. It also showcases a lot of those, like, it's like the classic D&D setting. It's mm-hmm. like, um, mm-hmm. oh, what is it? And the, Neverwinter. Um, yeah, the sword. It's the sword yeah, coast, and then Neverwinter is like the main city it takes place in. Yeah, um, and it, it's just a really solid movie. You can see the moments where, like, it's something that's great that kind of gets you into the world and into the feeling as someone who doesn't play the game um, or know a lot about the game. And then as a player, you can also sit there and you can. I, I've watched it like four or five times at this point. Um, and I notice new things every time of like when you watch the fight scenes, they all go in order, like initiative order, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they follow that order. And then you see like each of the spells in it is an actual spell in 5e that you can like be like, oh, that was Frostfinger or whatever it's called. And then uh, Green Spectral Blade. And yeah, they were very, and stop. you can tell that they were very intentional with what was used and what wasn't, which yeah. is nice. You can tell when somebody failed and you can tell when someone succeeded mm-hmm. um, like really well. Uh, there's a part where one of the characters like throws a potato and like clocks somebody in the head and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. so that was like a bullshit nat 20 roll yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, out of nowhere. Uh, another form of like media to kind of consume, and probably the most popular of D and D media, are actual plays. Yeah. Um, real playthroughs with real people at the table. Yes. Uh, so the biggest of those is going to be Critical Role, which we talked a little bit about before. And one of the um, first to it, really go public yeah, with it and get like really monetized first, uh, and. Oh you know. yeah, um, it is a group of famous voice actors. Uh, it's got Ashley Johnson, Laura Bailey, Marcia Ray. Um, if you like Last of Us, both Abby and Ellie um, are yeah. Laura Bailey and Ashley Johnson. Um, My favorite games. Such a solid game. Of all time. Uh, I'm a PlayStation fanboy, so I know I've played both Last of Us and Last of Us 2. I have every edition that exists of both of those games. Not like collectors, but they had a PS4 and then a PS4. And then they had a PS5 upgrade and a PS5 upgrade. And they were both like complete remasters from the ground up. The way that I spent seventy dollars on, on one game that I already owned, and then another seventy dollars on another game that I already owned, just to see it in better like definition and picture. I want to criticize it, but I sat there and watched you play through the entire of The Last of Us because I wanted to play the game, They're but I'm so not good. Personally yeah, we never finished Last of Us too because that one hurts. But um, but I would be like like, don't play the game when I'm not here because I want to like watch and the quality was yeah fucking insane amazing oh my God. shout out to those voice actors for bringing so much trauma to <laughs> our screens but in like a, a wonderful amazing way yes and they are wonderful actors and some of their like moments watching are, it's like it's so emotional watching them they're like they're wonderful players they're professionals at it uh yeah. they get joined by lots of different people Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Erica Ishii, who I personally love, another great voice actor. Um, Brendan Lee Mulligan has joined them. Abria Iyengar has joined them. Um, but Legend of the Vox Machina was um, the the show that we talked about earlier was based off of their campaign one, mm-hmm. um, which is and I'm still Tell making my Dory, way through. Yes. Which now has all of its own merch and branding and yes. minifigures and shit in the gaming oh, store. Yeah. It's so cool to see. Where's Dimension 20s, figures and minis <laughs> and merchandise in the store? I think store. Dimension I'm still 20 has to too see. many hard opinions to have a partnership with Wizards of the Coast. No, that's fair. That's fair. I, I think, personally, I think that's why 
But speaking of Erica Ishii, Brendan Lee Mulligan, and I, I can't. Oh wait, wait, how wait! Do you pronounce the last there, one. I do want to say. Um, What's a, the last one? Abria Iyengar. Abria. I love Abria. Is it Abria? Abria. Abria. Okay. I love her. I Iyengar. love them so much. Um, oh, but you can find Critical Role for free on YouTube. You can find all of it. There are like hundreds of hours of content for you to watch through if you want. Or yeah, you can yeah, look yeah, up yeah. like summary ones or straight up sometimes watching those is exhausting. You can go to the wiki page and like read a summary. Mm -hmm. But speaking of those people, Robert. Dimension 20, which is Yay! becoming um, sort of a fan favorite, mostly because of how different it is from a lot of the other D&D &D spaces that are out there. Just in terms of their uh, their world building and mm -hmm. the, their DM, Brennan Lee Mulligan in particular, has like really popularized their um, their brand of doing it, kind of like Critical Role has done it. Uh, their first campaign was um, Fantasy High, and it was it was really really good. So good. It was amazing. Um, it was it set the tone perfectly for what they wanted to do with the rest of their campaign. So Critical Role is very much bound in like this uh, traditional D&D &D space, high fantasy ask or high fantasy adjacent, not to say that that's all they do, and they're amazing at it. And so I think Dimension 20 and Brennan Lee Mulligan specifically really wanted to take them, uh, like their brand of it in a direction where it was like off D&D &D or more modern settings yeah. or more different settings. I think the original concept was like if John, if, Dungeons and Dragons was set in like a John Hughes coming of age movie. Yeah, a hundred percent. And Fantasy High, like, is one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best intros to like actual plays and what yes. D D can be in a non traditional fantasy setting. Yes. And it still is very traditional fantasy. Their take on it though is that like <laughs> they take all of these like pre existing like elves and orcs and like evil bullshit and volcanoes and demons yeah. and dragons and then put it in like a modern setting like where technology exists neighborhood yeah and then also part of that world building is like yeah we're one of the only places where we just allow teenagers to do this crazy shit and yeah so the whole thing is fun it's it's absolutely it's a blast start to finish. uh you can find all of fantasy high for free on youtube as well um the rest of dimension 20 which you can find a lot of free stuff from Dimension 20 on YouTube. Yeah. You They'll usually the do, like, the first free episode of every yeah. campaign that they do somewhere. The The full collection is behind a, uh, like, $5 paywall a month on mm -hmm. Dropout, um, which used to be the College Humor Company has rebranded to Dropout. They've got a bunch of other shows on there. Yep, I personally yep. think it's really worth it. Um, but I know that we have our own personal, like, favorites mm -hmm. in um, Really Dimension quick, though, specifically from College Humor, like, the people that they feature a lot yes. and most often in, like, their primary campaigns. So, Renly Mulligan is almost always the DM, Lou Wilson, Emily Oxford, uh, Allie, Allie Beardsley, Z Zach Oyama, and then... Siobhan, right? Siobhan. Sh Jesus Christ. You would think <laughs> with as many times as I've seen her name pronounced. I'm so sorry, yeah. if Siobhan, if you ever watch this. Please watch this. I'm stupid. But Siobhan Thompson. Uh, uh, are and like, Brian Murphy. And Brian Murphy, yeah, are like originally part of that first like cast and then continued to do some of the most popular ones. Now they're starting to bring in different cast members for different yes, campaigns. Yes, they've got lots of different guest stars, guest yeah. DMs. That, uh, Matt Mercer uh, DM'd one for them recently because yeah. all of their – so Dimension 20 is the name of like the series, and each yeah. they have like – campaigns or seasons and they're all completely different so there's been ones that have been set in space mm -hmm. there's ones that have been starstruck like odyssey starstruck odyssey um my candy land favorite. crown of candy that's my favorite i'll let you talk about crown yours first though because crown of candy was traumatizing and that's why i love oh, it the it's most. brilliant though also hank green was one of their most recent stars so if mm -hmm. on mentopolis people like hank one of my green so far uh, yeah, that's a kids on bike system. So oh my god, Hank did. Green's a phenomenal player. Also, oh, yeah. I'm Hank like, is, and his character is literally he just info dumps on people yeah. to like traumatize them before he kills them, it's, and it's perfect because it's, it's incredible. just it's just Hank Green whipping out random fucking facts. Oh, and seeing Hank Green and Brendan Lee Mulligan like his encyclopedia each other of a brain is, is yeah. insane. It's so good. And the, like in the last so episode, much. his character met another character who was the exact same thing. It was like hyperfixation and cataloging of niches, and they literally just threw facts at each other, like Brennan and Hank, just back and forth for like oh, five it minutes. It was it was incredible. Meeting of the minds. 
Uh, absolutely. Your favorite. Oh, my your favorite. favorite uh, my yeah, favorite campaign, favorite campaign was um, Unsleeping City, which was basically. Um, it was their second one, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Or, they they or, had the one shot, uh, Blood uh, Keep, Blood and Keep. that Alex Mercer played an actual character there at the table. That was like a, a one shot. Everyone was level twenty. Yeah. Um, super cool to watch, by the way. If anyone's, mm-hmm. that's a great place to start if you're looking to see what a one shot could look like, because they're all level twenty characters. Um, it's, they all play villains and like evil characters as well. So it's kind of like this fun to play the bad guy type deal. Yeah, it was really cool. But Unsleeping City is my personal favorite. It's kind of like, it's, it's magical New York. It's like New York exists and it's this world that also has like magic underneath the surface that people don't see. And it deals, it's the oddest mix of people. It's like an Mm -hmm. aging Broadway star. Firefighter. And a firefighter. Who's who's not magical. Who's not magical. He's just a himbo. He's got a magical Um, axe. A rat. That's his whole thing. A man who was turned into a rat. Um, Shout out to Cug Rash, one of my favorite characters in any campaign ever. He's just a fucking shape-shifting rat. He's so great. And then Pete the Plug, who's a, uh, a drug dealer who, like, finds out that he's got, like, He's very important magic, and it's just uh, the world building it. It is beautiful. Oh, and my f- how did I forget? Like my favorite character is uh, Emily's character, who's base. I think she described it as like if Fran from the Nanny went on like an Amy Winehouse bender. Um, and she's like a she's from Staten Island, and she just got dumped. And it's just what was the what was Lou's character? Uh, uh, Kingston Brown. Kingston Brown. He was one of my favorites as he well. He was amazing. It's just such a solid campaign it's such a fun world i love the world building in it mm-hmm. i love all the voices um because i'm a sucker for like accents and things like that it yeah, was just yeah. it was just a really compelling story it was really fun and there were so many mm-hmm. easter eggs as like someone who and they had uh, a lot of a lot of great twists and hooks and story points yeah. and it flowed very naturally it was super solid but i also really do like crown of candy mm-hmm. um which hey this shit sucks do you have something you want to send in to make it better criticisms topics you'd like to see discussed or an advertisement you'd like to run maybe you even want to sponsor an episode if so shoot us a message at mc460 at evansville.edu or dm us on instagram at crescent magazine or we'll never get better like these fucking guys yeah i will gladly talk about so i i started we started watching dimension 20 on our own um it was when we met when we studied abroad together is when we both realized that we watched it but uh, we watched it originally on our own, and Crown of Candy was one of the one of the first campaigns that I had listened to all the way through. So I listened all the way through Fantasy High. I got through Unsleeping City. Um, I kind of like listened to Blood Keep a little bit, and then Crown of Candy had come out. So for any of you that have seen Game of Thrones or know what Game of Thrones is and what it's known for, which is uh, lots of sex, lots of incest, lots of murder, uh, no holds barred, political bar, intrigue, favorite characters die every other episode. Um, bloodlines. Yeah, bloodlines, crazy like house feuds and all that, all that uh, nutty shit. That's basically what Crown of Candy is. But the setting is Candyland, mm-hmm. so it's all the grit and seriousness and like turns and just unrelenting like danger, but set in a world of candy. Yeah, uh, which I think is almost exactly how Brennan introduces it. Like it's literally just set yeah. in a world of candy. Um, but it's not just candy as well. It's yeah. like the whole food pyramid is there. So you have um, the dairy aisle. Yeah, you have the yeah the Dairy Islands. Um, you have the like the Meatlanders. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the the Vegetarians. You have uh, the the Fructarians. Yeah. yeah, the Fructarians. You can tell I've watched this multiple times. <laughs> um, and it all centers on the main cast that comes back to play again. Uh, Brennan, Brian, Saban, the whole rest of them, and they play like a royal family from Crown of Candy, mm-hmm. going to like this first big, um, basically like inauguration of like the new. Uh, king of of all of um, of like I forget what the whole thing itself was called, but basically like of everything, right? Like the one person that sits on the top of it all. Yeah. Uh, and it starts off like very casual. There's a lot of danger. There's a lot of political intrigue. Every one of Brennan's NPCs is on some fuck shit. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like he's always on some fuck shit, and I really respect him for it. I really yeah. like vibe with that. But Crown of Cunning was another level, and it's like some of the coldest lines oh my you've God. ever and heard in your life. And it's some of the life. most unrelenting DMing and like ruthless plot points I think I've ever it's, seen it's, or read. It's so brutal. Like, I, mild spoiler for like the second episode. 
episode. Mm -hmm. um, they're in a caravan. They're all like relatively low level characters, and Siobhan and Emily are playing two twins, and they're like the yeah. royal daughters. I'm gonna so talk about a, a moment with those two that yeah. was one of my favorite moments from any they campaign ever. They play at a lower level than like everyone else because the rest they're of the children. Are, like, they adults. do level up quicker than everyone else, yeah. though. So like they're trying, like they do like the leaps to like make up in the levels. But yeah, that was such a cool but, fucking like, touch from like a DM yeah, and a player perspective was, that was a to really, be really lower cool than everyone. It was so cool, and they handled it so well. But like. In the first combat encounter, before it's even a combat encounter, one of them was like hanging out of the carriage, yeah. gets shot with an arrow, fun. dies, being an aloof, dies yeah. immediately, being an aloof teenager, and then immediately just gets fucking socked by an arrow and goes limp. Yeah, I, it comes back. Cause and there was D &D like a real something. moment where that character could have died immediately. Yeah, the amount of like assassination attempts that happen on like the king's Lou Wilson. Um, are insane, and it's you don't nutty. see any of them coming. It's, it's some so of my nutty. favorite role playing from Zach Wayama in like oh my any ca campaign I've ever watched him do when he did um, Lapel, which is a chocolate fucking bunny, which is hilarious. He has this moment with this carrot. Uh, so I think it's like Sir Carrots in Deep Root. Again, I've watched this too many times. And he slaps a carrot across the face. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say what he says in that moment because I would really encourage you to watch it. But it's one it's of the most so like cold. laugh out loud. Holy shit moments of, of the entire campaign. But my favorite role-playing moment nuts. from that happened between the two sisters with mm -hmm. uh, Siobh Siobhan? Siobhan. Siobhan. God, you literally, damn it. You, she's uh, one of your favorite Siobhan. cast members. You talk Siobhan, about her a Siobhan, lot. Siobhan, 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 and Emily as the two sisters. Um, I'm not going to say what happens, but there's a really, really, really fucked up like emotional height to the campaign that basically yeah. kicks off the whole second act. Yes. And it's the first time I've seen players cry at the table, like genuinely sobbing, crying because of what happened at the table. And I had like goosebumps watching it. Like it made me cry because it's yeah. like it's some of the best role playing that I've seen. It like the world building, the connections between the characters like that cast just does such a good fucking job of getting into yeah. character as like trained actors and voice actors. Yeah, and, and like, I mean a lot of them have backgrounds in like acting or improv or writing. Yeah. And I do want a quick shout out to Critical Role cuz I've sitting through and like watching the first campaign and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh emotional moments at the table where it's yeah. very similar to that height and it's mm -hmm. just like sobbing at the table and it's like wow these like silly games can really like affect people <laughs> these silly like, games these silly basement games can really yeah. make you feel things like i mean i i'm at the table crying constantly because i'm in yeah. theater and yeah, i yeah. do that but it's dimension but, 20 is phenomenal i don't think yeah can, moving like, moving on from enough. dimension 20 yeah. eventually right so we do watch Dimension 20 more than Critical Role, which should be obvious at this point. Not to say <laughs> one is better than the other. It's just, it's, it's a personal, personal yeah, it's a personal preference. It's a personal taste thing. Um, but truly, I don't believe one is better than the other. I think everyone that participates in both is amazing. It's just one's a little more traditional, one's a little less. Yeah. Um, then the other kind of form of actual plays out there are podcast actual plays. Um, I'm so, I know that sounds, this is going to sound silly to say as someone who's currently hosting a podcast, I struggle a lot of the time to listen to podcasts just because I, have, I need visual stimuli. Yeah, I don't listen to podcasts um, all that often, if ever, really. Yeah, I've listened to a couple, but at ADHD, I need something like happening, which yeah. is why I kind of lean towards. I'm ashamed to say that one of the only podcasts I've ever listened to was Joe Rogan. Oh, my God. Not because I agree with, oh my with his views, but if you just like interesting conversations between interesting people, regardless of how bad shit insane they are, the amount of people that he has had on from like all different perspectives and professions and worldviews is impressive. There are like something like going on two thousand episodes, and they're Jesus all like Christ. two and a half hours long. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, so I've listened. That is to also those. the same explanation my dad gives for listening to it. Yeah, because I mean, I think as a <laughs> as a, a tangent, as somebody that listens to Joe Rogan, I feel like <laughs> a lot of the times, like the normal person that's not there to like watch and listen to the politics and like be uh, like aff affirmed in their views, mm -hmm. he is such a good host for the conversations that he has, and it sucks because like he has a lot of not so great views, but he's also really open minded, and then he brings on like astrophysicists and vegans and vegetarians and far right wing and far left wing. He'll bring those people to the table at the same time and moderate a conversation or a debate. And it's just, if you ignore half the shit that comes out of his mouth, which he does frequently say he doesn't know anything, which is why he's bringing people on his podcast, it's enjoyable to just hear people from across the table talk. I get that. That's my tiny little side note about how I justify sure, watching Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. We'll go back into talking about actual plays. Uh, so actual plays. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, which we've had a couple of people ask us if we're going to do an actual play. We might get uh, that. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Um, this... We're for sure going to spend a couple of episodes talking about our campaigns that yeah. we've done previously. I'll say this room is just very small. I don't know how we would get any, like. Yeah, we'd have to, like, borrow audio here. equipment and then soundproof the basement. And yeah. It would be a hot mess. Maybe one day. Keep your eye out. Because that's something the Adventure I'm Zone, Dungeons and Daddies. Yes, uh, the Adventure Zone is from if you know the McElroy brothers um, from the My Brother, My Brother and Me podcast, um, which is one that I've listened to. It is them and their dad playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, they're really good. I don't think I've listened to all that much of the Adventure Zone, but I know a ton of people. Are they the have ones who did Tiny Heist? Yeah, they were in Tiny Heist yep, on, Dimension featured, 20. Featured on Dimension Twenty. Um, so if you want to see one where they where you can see like. Uh, visual while they're playing mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is another very fast sidebar about Dimension 20 Rick Perry's the person in charge of like the art for it and the minis on that show and the set design insane it is the like I, I can't even verbalize they put it. off I'm some telling of their you campaigns. as a listener close this podcast and open up on Google and look up Dimension 20 minis and like Rick Perry's and work set it is it is phenomenal. This last one from Mintopolis is probably one of oh the most interesting I've so ever cool seen. Oh my god, it's so cool looking. It's like a Rue Goldberg machine. Yeah, Mintopolis has got a crazy set design. Also, Crown of Candy has one of the nuttiest set designs. Yeah. Um, Fantasy High was pretty good, but that was before they like really, really got into it. Um, and I think they've now started putting off campaigns before, like so that way they oh, they so can give time. Rick time to build sets and minis. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but back to the actual place. The Adventure Zone is really good. I've got a lot of mutuals who are really into it, so I'm gonna hype that up. Um, Dungeons and Daddies. I've got. I've listened to like the first two episodes. I'm still working my way through it. Uh, but the cast is really solid. I also know a lot of people um, who listen to that and hype it up a lot. It's about uh, dads who get sucked into basically a game of D and D, and they try to mm-hmm. save their kids. That sounds um, actually really cool. Yeah. Yeah. You should check it out. I guess I should. Um, and, and we are trying to listen to more. Yeah, you know, we just like we both in the realm. suffer from ADHD, yeah. and so it's like we're gonna get twenty minutes into a podcast episode, and then we're gonna hop to something else. Yeah. So bear um, with us. But then two others, not another D and D podcast, which is hosted by uh, Brian Mad Murphy. Pod. Um, so that's gonna have Brian Murphy and Emily Axford, as well as a bunch of other wonderful people in it. Um, and then Worlds Beyond Numbers, which is a newer one that we are about to pull the trigger and get the yeah subscription the Patreon the Patreon for yeah, get through the little um, paywall. And that's Erica Ishii, um, Abria Einger, um, Lou Wilson, and Brennan Lee Mulligan. So the four of my personal favorite mm-hmm, people mm-hmm, in this mm-hmm. space ever. Yeah. Um. And then the next kind of area or, like, topic uh, would be kind of, like, how do you play D&D? What do you need to play? Um, so this is, this is our little equipment list. Yeah. Um, source books, which we talked about a little bit before. You can buy mm. physical copies. You can buy digital copies. You know, you could look online and see what you find for yeah. free. Peruse the internet and just innocently that. see what's out there floating yeah. around. Um, so for some source books, I know there's, like, DM ones and player-specific ones. Yeah, so there are, like, there's the Player's Handbook. There's also, uh, th- and this is, the ones that I'm going to list now are specifically from Wizards of the Coast under, like, Dungeons and Dragons. But there's, like, the Player's Handbook. There's uh, the Dungeon Master's Handbook. There's, um, oh, what is it? There's, like, a shit ton of different names for all the different expansions they've done. There's, uh, like, there's, Xanathar's there's Guide to Everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tasha's Cauldron Mon- of Everything. Monster's Manual. Monster's Manual. Yeah, so generally the only one that you're going to need ever as a player, as long as your DM has the resources they need for the campaign beforehand, the only one that you ever could even think to look at as a player would be the Player's Handbook, and that's if it's your first time. It walks you through uh, basic character creation, and how to do that on a character sheet. It also talks about action economy, like what your actions are in combat, what initiative is. It walks you through what all your individual scores are. Uh, so like what intelligence means, what wisdom means, what charisma means, how to add up those modifiers, which we recently had to do for the first time because we've been spoiled by fun digital apps that do it for yes. us. Um, but like I don't – I've never – encourage my players to to have a source book outside of that because if you're i don't want to say if you're a good dm that sounds elitist if you're a good dm quote on you just said you don't necessarily need to give your players a handbook unless you just want them to be able to do some of that world building like in advance like I set a campaign in Theros, or I set part of a campaign in Theros, and so I, I encourage them to go and read bits from that source book to understand more about the gods that exist in that area and, like, how the system works. And it ended up for, like, some... When you're doing it in a way like that, there was a pretty cool moment where um, 
I was yeah. playing a character who was. Uh, we'll talk about her eventually. She was a she was a thief. She was a yeah. liar. She was a cheat. She was she every was... everything shitty embodied, but like a good person, really yes. far underneath the surface. Very very far. But um, when we were like you know, kind of chilling around. I was, my character was trying to find a way to bring someone back from the dead. Mm. I was flipping through and I found something about, oh, well you, or I went to like a cleric office and the yeah. clerics were like, well, you can ask a God for a favor. And I was mm. like, well, I don't have a good relationship with yeah, any yeah. of those. And there just so happened to be a God who literally cheated death in the yeah. setting of Theros. And it was absolutely, it was, it was, uh, Finax, God of Deception, and yep. I like read the source book obsessively, and I was mm. like, I brought that up at the to table. Find and all I the think different that ways ended that you up could, being yeah. a yeah, really, yeah. really cool uh, kind of point. So, you yeah. know, at the same time, I'm someone who likes to read and be like over informed to the. You just gotta like, be careful about who you give PDFs book. and who because you give I source <laughs> material to because there are some motherfuckers like the person sitting next to me that if you give them a source book and you say you read pages one through five and you shut the rest of it out, they'll read the whole thing. Yeah. And then know. curiosity killed the campaign because now they understand your stat blocks you're using. They know the campaign hooks you might be pulling from. They know the the locations on the maps you're gonna take them to. Oh, yeah. So I, that's why I personally uh, ward against handing people source books. If you're doing it on a PDF, do, like, export to PDF or print to PDF and give them yeah. specific pages you want them to which see. Which is what he had to do. Yeah, which is what I did. I was, uh, but, I'm a problem, and I know yeah. I'm a problem. But I will also hype up for players. Um, if, if you're looking at, like, um, Xanthar's or um, Tasha's, they've got more, like, spells in there um, and more race options, um, which I always like kind of, like, experimenting and going a little outside the box with those. And it has some of my personal favorite spells. Like, I love Tasha's Hideous Laughter uh, is one of my favorite spells, and I keep trying to use it, and it keeps failing. But one of these days, it's going to work. Yeah, and what I will say about all of the information that I just talked about that you could get from Player's Handbook or anything like a beginner's manual there is not a single aspect of D&D 5e when it comes to character creation or what you need to know as a player that you cannot just fucking Google. That is Like, weird. straight up, if you just Google, like, Paladin class breakdown or a Kaladin, like Paladin advancement table or yeah. wizard advancement table or wizard spell list. The internet is a huge help. We use wiki. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, D &D D &D like, yeah, D&D dot, like, yeah, D&D dot wiki, um, or I guess wiki dot D&D, like, any of those websites. Uh, Wizards, I will say, has their own, uh, like, hosting site and app uh, mm -hmm. called D&D &D &D Beyond. There is a slight paywall for that. The convenience of D and D Beyond, if you have the money to spend on it, is that it rolls in every source book mm -hmm. that they have ever published. As long as you buy them, you do still have to buy them onto uh, and a player app that you can then use to do the character creation and the building. And it saves some of the time with trying to figure out what plugs into what, because not every app is going to be as uh, as Intuitive. updated and concise as D and D Beyond can be. But if yeah. you just need the information raw, like if you just need the advancement table or just need a list of spells. Just Google it. Just Google it. Truly just verbatim, put in what you need and there will probably be a wiki dot for it. Yeah. I personally prefer using like wiki dot for my spell list because it has everything broken down yep. in classes, in levels, in everything and just a very concise I go to thing. I go to a website, I think it's called like D and D RPG dot bot or something like that. And it literally it does breakdowns by um like what I don't know who the author is of the website or the publisher and what gives them the authority to do this, but they break down every spell available for each class by level, and then they break down like the usefulness and they highlight them. And like red being one oh, star, it's yeah. shit. If it's if it's blue, it's got four stars. It's I amazing. Do you know that one? Yeah, and so I use that to get a bit more of like an opinionated idea about it. But when it comes to source books, when it comes to material as a player, I truly don't believe you need a single goddamn thing as long as your DM has what you need yeah. in advance. I, this is a game where you could dump hundreds of dollars and have a lot of physical things into it. Or you can it, spend or, nothing. Or you can spend nothing. I yeah. think I am this. I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say that. Yeah. Uh, I've dumped the most money personally into dice. Yeah. Uh, dice is another thing that you will need, which also, if yeah, you don't want to. Most TTRPGs are going to have you yeah. use some set of dice. They're going to vary. D traditionally, yeah, traditionally, it's D &D. a D4, a D6, a D8, a D10. A D12 and a D20, but not mm -hmm. all of them are going to use those. And also, if you don't want to spend the money on dice, which fair, some of them are extremely expensive. You can get, them you can get dice cheap. from ranging like in six dollars up to like a hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, my fiance. Shout money. out to my fiance Al, again for the second time. She bought me a really nice pair of dice for my birthday. I think they were like a hundred and twenty or something like that. Yeah, they were a lot. Uh, they're like custom resin they had this really like beautiful inlay uh they're like blue black and gold i'm obsessed with the movie avatar we had just watched avatar uh way of water 
and like all of those colors were very prominent and so she thought it would be like really cool to get me a set of dice that are kind of like reminiscent from that movie and that's exactly what I think of them every time I roll them they have like a liquid core in them too but yeah there's no there's no ceiling to how expensive and how fancy and how custom you can get with your dice but there definitely is a floor I mean some game shops like we went to several when we were in the UK I don't think I, I don't think I've seen this anywhere around here, but, like, sometimes they'll just have a bin of random misfit dice, and you can just, like, throw them together, and they're, like, 10, 20 cents a piece. Yeah. And also, then, they have similar things here, but they're not 10 to 20 cents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the cheapest set I've seen around here is, like, 5 or $6, and it's yeah. just for, like, a very generic, like, mono-colored or mono-colored yeah. and speckled set of dice, but it's all you need. Which, and you can also just straight up go to Google and say, roll yeah. like a D20. Tell Google to roll. And it'll do that for you. And there you, are so. apps, too, that are designed specifically for that kind of mm-hmm. thing. If you prefer it in more of like a sleek, like on the go, like kind of phone format. Yeah. They're very nice. So I personally, they call me a dice goblin. I do not like She is a dice fucking goblin. dice goblin. It's I'm something not. that they've talked about on Dimension 20 several times. Uh, she's a fucking dice goblin. She's a dice goblin. I literally I went to the game store earlier last week. Okay, well. And she was like, if you're there, when you're there, be on the lookout for this color dice for this new character that I'm playing. I do, but I buy a new set of dice for every character. Which I think is cool. I think that's Which fine. Which is fine. And then, still yes, makes do I also dice goblin. have like four, five, six, seven, sets outside of that yes also are they she's all... only played two characters <laughs> right she has 10 sets she has two characters you do the math on how many of those sets were for characters okay i did buy two sets for magnolia uh-huh, uh-huh. um because you know sometimes if i'm like well she had a big story beat i'm gonna buy a new set of dice <laughs> and they're all in the same color scheme they're all pink or like blue purple gold like flowy yeah and but I like all my stuff to be matching, and pink is my lifestyle color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really quick before we hop into the next thing, I realized what I didn't talk about was what, and I'll do this very quickly, what you need as a DM in terms oh, of source yes. books. Source books for DMs can be a lot more crucial than for players. Like, as a player, I truly don't believe you need a single thing as long as you have access to the internet and your DM knows enough about the game. As a DM, you will feel, like I promise, you will feel very pressured to buy a source book. Um, and that's because unless you are somebody who enjoys world building and is good at it uh, and has spent a lot of time doing it, it's incredibly intimidating. And, like, you're not going to be a Tolkien. You're not going to be, like, a J.J.R. Martin. You're not, like, you're not Scorsese. You're not Christopher yeah. Nolan. Like, please be aware that you don't need to have something that's laid out A to Z. One of my favorite stories to tell with this specifically is one that uh, Brennan was talking about one of his first campaigns when he started getting into D&D was he had the whole thing written, this like massive complex story, start to finish, and then basically there was one decision that seemed pretty straightforward that his players needed to make to kick off the rest of the campaign. And they made one that he did not write or account for and then had no material to work with. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad that I had watched and listened to that before I became a DM because it really helped me not over prepare. But in terms of source books, in terms of source materials, do the same thing we talked about with players. Just search up what you're looking for. Maybe throw in the word PDF behind it. Maybe, Maybe you don't. You know. That's up to you. It depends on how ethical you're feeling. <laughs> um, and then there you go. You have everything you need. Don't please, please, please don't play story point for story point out of a source book unless you're just that uncomfortable with it because I promise you will hit a wall very quickly where uh, your players want to completely go off the beaten path that your source book is telling you to go down. And it's going to be really difficult to get them back on. I mean, every group is a little different. Some some get more engaged with that traditional storytelling, but a lot of the storytelling in source books is very one-dimensional. And so it's it gets really easy for players to find ways to poke holes in that and to just fly off in another direction Mm -hmm. so if you're going to use a source book use it loosely use the maps use the world building use the npcs and the stat blocks and the gods and the this and that but try to avoid just straight up ripping the story from the book and having the players play that out let them tell their own story and that honestly takes so much away from you as a dm in terms of responsibility is you if you let your players tell the story at the table and just improv and role play which is you know easier said than done But truly, just have the world in your head and then let the players figure out the story for themselves and insert your hooks and your beats and your points as you go along. And you'll find that the players will 
we'll find the story that we want to tell. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, and it feels more engaging, I think, as players. And I, I don't know from the DM side, but yeah. it's really interesting to also be like, I had a hand in and creating this. There will be another episode where we do uh, more breakdowns on what like a world building is like as a DM and stuff like that. So I won't, I won't continue to like belabor the point, right? But when it comes to source books, again for the sixteenth time, don't buy them if you don't absolutely need them. Yeah. Uh, another thing that you might need are friends and a DM or just people to play with, uh, which yeah. we kind of talked about earlier before. Um, you will run into scheduling problems. It will be an issue. Jesus know that. Christ. I tried to do a fucking Google calendar and insert everyone's availability into it, and I thought I was going to have a seizure looking at it. Like It was bad. It, it is always going to be an issue. We've got two of the people that we play with work night shift, and yeah, then some of us work swing work shift. The other one works straight up night shift. And, and none of the days align. It's going to be something that happens. Sometimes you just have to play D&D at 8 in the morning on Saturdays. Um, next thing you'll need is a notebook or a laptop notebook. If you're old-fashioned, if you want to do pencil and paper, you're more than welcome to do pencil and paper. I personally lean more towards a laptop because I'm an obsessive note taker and I like to type up all of my notes really quickly and I feel like it's easier sometimes to find information yep, yep. Um, on here because character sheets can look very very overwhelming I just designed new character sheets for the campaign we're playing currently because it was just kind of a stroke to look at because mm -hmm. you're packing so much information yeah. on one yeah, page yeah, yeah. so I'm always going to hype up apps in the internet and the computer yeah and I use a combination between a notebook and a laptop yeah and a calculator you know I'm bad at math Yep. I failed math in high school. Shout out to Google. More than Shout once. out to your calculator app um, on your iPhone or Android. So when I roll, you know, like 8d6 plus yep. 2d4. And then, of course, you're always going to have that person that wants to count up all the dice themselves and be like, look, I learned how to them. do quick math. Yes, we have several people at the table that are like that. And I'm like, I can type like the numbers in my As you're typing in the numbers into your calculator, they're like 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 10 plus 25 plus 67. And it's like, homie, like I'm literally putting it in the calculator. You're going to have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, you're going to look to me at the end of this and go, am I right? We can avoid this whole interaction. Yep. Let people add up their own numbers unless they ask for help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then kind of after that uh, are character sheets. And a character is kind of the last thing yeah, you need to. Well, good. actually before that. There's the debate with minis. I personally like minis or having some type of like physical thing, but mm -hmm. they are not necessary at all. I don't think Critical Role yeah. uses minis at all. You can do like full imagination. And D&D &D um, is still very much one of those games where as long as you have a little bit of game sense, you can do the whole thing in your fucking head. You don't yeah. have to have a battle map. You don't have to have a giant race board. You don't have to have a fun TV screen. You don't even have to have like a digital thing. Like as long as you yeah. got your imagination and you can think about shit you've seen in a video game or a movie, you're solid. Which like you really, if you want something physical and you're looking for like the easiest option, a whiteboard. Yeah, whiteboard. And get dry race markers and then write um, things down and then get like Monopoly pieces. You can get your minis. bundles of battle maps for like 15 bucks off Amazon and it's mm -hmm. like six battle maps and each of them are dry erase with your little, your, your little five by, or your, yeah, your squares and then they flip and then you have another uh, biome or like kind of environment on the back. Those yeah. are easy if you can yeah, shell out like 16 bucks. Right now, we, uh, we've we pimped the basement out. Play on a shitty TV. Uh, yeah, we're, we're playing on an old TV, and yeah. we just hook up laptops to it, and it makes us feel super classy and like high class, like those digital like game tops, yeah. which are not necessary, but well, also I'm obsessed with all of the like fancy D&D yeah. And then quick side note with digital, uh, digital tabletops, um, you can literally make any number of maps and play – like, it's a rabbit hole. It, it really is a rabbit oh, yeah. hole. But the amount of applications and websites that exist for you to play everything fully digitally and have that experience be absolutely fucking nutty yeah. is unreal. So if you just, even if you guys want to play in person, set everybody up with a laptop or a cell phone or some kind of a screen, mm -hmm. and then you can do it all there for free. I mean, yeah. obviously you need a laptop and the, you know, the phones or whatever, but yeah, Steal that's one. that's the other Go way. Go to you a library. If you don't want to just try and figure out, okay, this person's diagonally 15 feet from me, so what is my spell range? Diagonal means they're 10 feet, not actually 5 feet. What does that even mean? Yeah. but yeah. That's, That can that's get difficult, but it's doable. Yeah. Uh, so then, yeah, last things you'll need are a character and character sheets, which uh, is what we're going to kind of like delve Talk into Talk about next, next session, episode, because it's a whole can of worms. Oh, yeah. I personally, I spend a lot of time on character creation. I spend a lot of time on background that's unnecessary. Yeah, and then you have people, uh, like one of the 
one of the people that plays at our our table is also one of our our roommates, Dakota, who will make like seventy five characters in thirty minutes that are all like slightly different, like not even that different, slightly different than the person, than the, literally the character he made two minutes ago. Yeah. But it's like a completely different class and race, um, and he's just like, "Cool, I'm ready to go." Like, "Cool, you want to like TPK us? You want to wipe the whole party? I got another one right here." Yeah, it's like playing cards. Oh yeah, um, yeah but yeah. we'll also deal with talking about you know like classes and races and um, subclasses and all of those like fun things, which are all things that go into character creation, which make it more than just filling out a random sheet because you can make you can be as invested in your character as you want to be. Um, I choose to be over invested yeah and work i mean we'll talk about it next time but like don't be afraid to ask your dm yeah don't be afraid to watch a video don't oh, you yeah. know like adventuring academy with dimension 20 anything on critical role like just if you don't know how to do it look at the fuck up it's a big hobby people have done it for years before us well it's about that time that it is thank y'all for tuning in for another exciting episode of table talk like i totally remembered to say in the intro i'm maddie and this is robert and what do we have coming up next week so we are going to continue our All About D&D series and specifically talk about world building. So we originally wanted to do character creation for you guys, but we don't have our hands on any like great uh, recording equipment right now, so we're going to put that for video off. specifically. Yeah for, yeah, for video, because clearly the audio equipment we're recording on <laughs> shit. But anyways, we want you guys to be able to follow along as we literally do the character creation. Um, and so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna switch it up into world building first and talk about that from like a DM's perspective, and then like how as a player you work that in, and it's kind of a situation on which one comes first, because without a world you don't know how to properly guide your characters or your your players in making a PC, but also without your PC you don't really know what direction to take the world in. So it's kind of like a which came first, chicken or the egg sort of deal. The world building is one of my favorite things about D and D, so I am super excited. See y'all next Thursday. Bye bye.